the general topic of tonight's lecture is uh, something that really fundamental to the future survival continuity of the Jewish people, the question of conversion. It's also something that is one of those specialized areas in Jewish law that is reserved for Beth Dins, for Jewish courts, for halachic experts who deal with the subject. But it touches to the core of a question of who is a Jew. In the first lecture, you know, a few weeks ago, we spoke about the question of the importance of certifying Jewish status. Why it's, imp it's important when somebody comes to get married, when somebody comes to claim that they're Jewish and do anything that requires them to be Jewish, why it's important to be able to certify it halachically. Because without this particular classification, without this particular criteria, we wouldn't be sitting here today and conducting this lecture. It's a question of me, who are Yehudi, who is a Jew? And the Torah tells us, it was established, it's going to be in uh, next week, we're going to celebrate the festival of Shavuos. That is when we became a nation. I can hear myself. That's when we became a nation. And it was established at that point. It was established a long time before, but it was established at that point officially. It was revealed to us that there is an eternal definition who is a Jew. It's not some kind of a social convention, not something which is decided. Some people come together and they decide what's more convenient, what makes more sense. It's a, a godly convention. It's a godly decision, which is founded in the same root as the Torah itself and as the world itself. The same way as we are told that the Jewish people are chosen for certain destiny, for certain reason, Similarly, it's important to know who is a Jew. And a Jew is defined with a very simple definition, one of two, born from a Jewish mother or converted according to halacha, according to Jewish law. In other words, Hashem himself has told us what makes a conversion, a metamorphosis. It transfers somebody, makes like a, a new uh, birth, it's actually called, in the Talmud, it's called like a, somebody who converted is a, as if a person was a newborn. Because that person, he suddenly receives a new neshama, a new soul, a new identity. It's something which no rabbi can do. A rabbi can only follow what the halacha says, but only Hashem can give somebody a new soul. And... Um, Before we'll get into fundamental questions of what is a gir kahalacha, a gir according to Jewish law, and explain it in a, in a more substantive way, even though this particular lecture, the, all these lectures that I'm giving, they take one hour to give, but you could write books about them. So, um, the Talmud tells us in a tractate Yivamis, it's one of the many tractates of the, of the Talmud, and it's codified in Jewish law, in Maimonides, in the code of, in the Shulchan Aruch, that just like the Jewish people, 3,332 years ago, that's what we're going to celebrate in Shavuos, they, so to speak, also converted. They also had to go to a similar process to be, to, uh, to be considered Jewish. Similarly, every single human being that wants to come and to go through conversion, he must go through the same process. And the Rambam tells us, the Maimonides tells us, with three, with three things the Jewish people came into the covenant with brismila, circumcision, tvila, which means immersion in a mikveh, and korban, and a sacrifice. Later on, the Rambam mentions that there's one even more fundamental criteria, and that is acceptance of mitzvahs. And the reason why I didn't mention this in this particular sentence, he only mentioned three things. He mentioned uh, circumcision, immersion, and sacrifice, because those three things are necess necessary 
components. But without acceptance of mitzvahs, there's no conversion. One has to be able to accept the Jewish way of life in order to, be, to become a convert. So what does it mean? It means that every single person had to, if it's a man, he had to be circumcised. Uh, and both men and women had to go through an immersion. And also to bring, sac- bring a sacrifice, which today we don't have because we have no temple. And there's an interesting discussion among scholars whether the fact that right now converts cannot bring a sacrifice, does that mean that they exempt altogether? Or does it mean that it's only sort of pushed off and Mashiach will come, they will have to bring a sacrifice? And all of this takes place in a certain order. And the very last part of the process is the immersion. So circumcision comes first. At some point, the... Uh, convert accepts the commandments in front of a Beisden in a very formal manner and ultimately the very last step is the immersion in the kosher mikveh. In other words, it can be just in any bath or any pool. It has to be in, in a mikveh which is deemed to be uh, qualifies the standards to transfer from, from in order to purify something. We know that we, we use the mikvah for many things in Judaism, and one of them is for conversion. If the mikvah wasn't kosher, it's as if nothing happened. So once the convert already reaches that level, and he or she goes under the water, by the time they come out of the water, they are already a new person with a new soul. So that is the general um, necessary parameters of conversion. Now I will give you a very short synopsis how the, the process takes place, for example, now in the 21st century in our Beth Din, which is very similar to any other Beth Din, any other qualified and recognized Beth Din. And I will compare to the way that is described in the Talmud and the codes, and we'll see if there's any difference. Today what happens is that anybody who wishes to convert, they have to apply. They apply... You know, the usual way to apply is today. We have modern technologies that they apply through a website. There is uh, all different forms. You can download one of them is for conversion. They fill in the form. They have the first meeting at the Beth Din. During the first meeting, we get to know the convert. We get to know, we read the the reasons why they want to convert. We understand the the dynamics, where they come from. Is there any connection to any other religions? Is there, you know, is there family situations, the convert by himself or with a partner, with uh, somebody that they want to marry? Um, is there any impediment why we can't convert a person? And the impediment, you know, usually when people come to convert, we give them the benefit of a doubt. We, we tell them everything which is required. We don't know in advance whether they'll be able to actually fulfill the requirements, but it doesn't matter because there's, as long as there's an understanding and transparency and they know exactly what is expected of them, there's no surprises, Basically, nobody feels cheated. They know they have to do certain things in order to convert. And if they do those things, they will eventually convert. And if not, not. But sometimes we see from the very beginning that for whatever reason, it's impossible. Again, not because we decide it, because that's what the Torah says and the halacha says. Because only a conversion according to halacha uh, creates that transformation. What are some examples when a person can convert, even if... Um, you know, in other words, it's, it, it's a, a, a deal break. It's, there's no way that a person can convert in such a particular situation. So one example is, let's, let's take an example, never happened really until now. Um, let's say that a pot- potential convert cannot be circumcised for medical reasons. It's not because they don't want to do it, because he doesn't want to do it, but because he can't. There's a particular medical reason that he may die if he's going to be circumcised. The Torah does not allow for somebody to convert without circumcision. So in other words, we don't want a person to die, so we wouldn't circumcise him. Today, by the way, it's very unusual. Today, even hemophiliacs can sometimes the ways how to do it without... But let's take a theoretical situation. The person really can't be circumcised. He will die if you will circumcise him. We don't want him to die, so we wouldn't circumcise him, but we can convert him because circum- circumcision is such an integral part of conversion that without it, the person doesn't become Jewish. 
And the codes tell us that even if it's a life and death situation, nevertheless, conversion cannot take place. If a person, for argument's sake, is a eunuch, is, is, a, is castrated before, so he can't be circumcised for physiological reasons, then it's okay. The Torah says he, if he can be circumcised because it's physically impossible, not medically, but physically, then it's a different story. But if it's medically impossible, then it's a deal breaker. Another example, which actually happened a few times in my experience, I recall it happened maybe four or five times, but I recall one specific situation very vividly. There was a very sincere candidate that came to speak to the Beth Din. Um, he really was somebody that wanted to be fully you know, involved in, in uh, Jewish life and embrace all the commandments. But um, ultimately, we, it came, became ap apparent uh, throughout the meeting that he was married to a non-Jewish lady, a very nice lady, who was very supportive of his journey and was going to accommodate him in everything. She was going to make kosher home and everything right. Ha however, unfortunately, we couldn't accept him into the process because he could never finish it. On one hand, we don't want him to get divorced because if it's a happily married couple, why should they get divorced? So we wouldn't even want it to happen because of us. But on the other hand, just like conversion process demands an embracement of Jewish lifestyle, which includes keeping Shabbos, keeping kosher, and keeping the commandments that a Jewish person is supposed to keep, you know, keep the family purity laws, keep uh, Yom Kippur, Pesach, and, and so on and so forth. At the same time, there's also a law against intermarriage. And um, to convert a person who automatically, once he converted, he'll be married out, that's something which Jewish law doesn't allow. So with great sympathy to him, because he was a very sincere person, we had to tell him it would be unfair of us to allow him to enter the process and to put all the effort in of you know, having private tutoring and everything else just to, to find out later that it's not going to happen. So those are examples of something that cannot happen because um, it just, um, it's not synthetic, it's not compatible with Jewish life or with conversion. There's also, there could be also situations when the particular candidate may still believe in Christianity and believe in the Jew because of his past connections. And he may not see that there is any contradiction between becoming Jewish and still believing in, in Jesus as the um, prophet or, or uh, son of God or Messiah. And we explain that that's something which is incompatible with Jewish beliefs. And therefore, that's something that you know, if a person wants to remain with those beliefs, that's also, it's not doable to convert um, him or her. So once we passed with the first meeting, when we get to know the person, and, we, and in, the first, in the very first meeting, we explain to the potential convert uh, the whole process in a nutshell, that there should be no surprises. We also try to do what's called in the, in the Talmud, the Chia, to push them away. We try to convince them not to convert. That's part of the process. And we do it in two ways. One way, we explain to them about the liabilities of being Jewish, anti-Semitism, hatred. Over here, the Shulchan Aruch says that the first thing we tell a person, and the Rambam says the same words, it comes from the Talmud, that we tell them that you know how hated the Jewish people are during uh, exile and how much anti-Semitism there is. And we talk about Holocaust and, and, and inquisitions and pogroms. And even today, so many years after the Holocaust, look around the world how much anti-Semitism there is. And we tell the person that while you're not converted, you're not, uh, you will not suffer from that particular treatment. But when you will convert, you will share the fate of the Jewish people. That's one particular element. And the other element we tell them about the fact that Judaism is a very, very unique religion. I mean, we believe and we know that's the only truth because you can't have multiple truths. So every religion claims they have the truth, and we know we have the truth. However, there's another difference. Every other religion that I know, virtually, I, I don't know of any other religion, believes, and you're talking about every single branch of Christianity, and Islam, and so on and so forth, they believe that if you will not convert to their religion, you are damned for eternity. Basically, they believe that in order to achieve salvation, 
and paradise, you have to convert to their religion. Muslims believe you have to convert to Islam and Catholics to Catholicism and Greek Orthodox to Greek Orthodoxy. Every single religion believes you must convert to their religion. The only religion that doesn't say that is Judaism. Judaism says that every person was created in a certain way. And while the Jewish person has no choice, a Jewish person cannot become a non-Jew. No matter what you do, you think you convert out, God forbid. If a Jewish person goes for baptism, or, or joins any other religion, he commits treason against his nation, against his God, against his religion, but he doesn't become non-Jewish. He still becomes a Jew. There's a special word for it in the Talmud. It's called a mummer, an apostate. But he still remains a Jew with, with all the implications. He loses many privileges, but he still attains, uh, he still is considered Jew in the eyes of God and in the eyes of Bethlehem and so on and so forth. So if, for example, a person converted to Christianity and then he married a Jewish woman under a chuppah, he requires a get. The woman requires a get. Because if he would be non-Jewish, the marriage wouldn't be considered marriage in the first place. So we explain to the potential convert that right now you created in the image of God and you could be a fine human being living a life of only seven commandments, being committed to seven laws that God has given in the Torah and the Talmud to the rest of the world. And there's no uh, expectations for you to convert, as far as God is concerned. So why do you want to be able to convert to a religion where you'll be obligated to keep Shabbos and kosher? 613 commandments, which whichever one's applicable, you know, now that the temple is in ruins and many commandments cannot be kept, but there's altogether 630 commandments on all of the rabbinic legislations, because without rabbinic legislations, there's no acceptance of the mitzvahs. It's part and parcel of Judaism. So we tell the person, why do you want the liability? You can be a fine person and you will eat on Yom Kippur, you will eat bread on Pesach, you, you can eat in all the French and Italian restaurants, and you're not committing any sins. The minute you become Jewish, it, it becomes a terrible sin to break all of those laws, and you become liable for it. And especially a convert who has volunta voluntarily accepted the commandments, the expectations on him are very, very great. So um, that's what we explain to them on the first meeting. And we let them go. We, we send them away. We give them a few books to read. And if they want, they can come for a second meeting. Once they come for a second meeting, and they're as determined as uh, the first time, then we accept them into the process. We give them a teacher. We have registered teachers uh, in our system. And we have a syllabus. The teachers act both as academic teachers and mentors and they start slowly but surely practicing what they're learning so they're starting to commit themselves to whatever subjects they're studying so when they come and study the the, the laws of kosher they become kosher and this and it happens in stages there's no expectation they should become immediate but we do want them to be to live an observant lifestyle for close to a year so when somebody asks how long the conversion process takes, it's not really up to us. It's, up to, it's more up to the candidate. It never takes less than a year, but usually we take maybe um, anything from a year and a half, two years. But some people like to take it very long, not because the Beth Din tries to drag it out, but some people say, listen, we want to take it easy, we want to take everything very slowly. And we'll leave it up to the person how quick it's going to take, as long as they understand what is expected. And ultimately, in every four or six months, they come to the Beth Din uh, at the initiative of the, of the teacher to have a progress report. Every single meeting is recorded. It's a very organized process. And ultimately, whenever they are ready for pre-final and final appointments, uh, they are being tested, not just academically, but, but even more so, we have to be sure of the commitment to live a Jewish life, and then if it's a, um, a, a man around this time, he would have to go through a circumcision. If he's already circumcised, then we, uh, on, a day of, uh, on the day of his immersion, we give him a touch of a needle just to draw some blood instead of circumcision, if he was circumcised already as a, uh, a child or before. And the final, final, uh, uh, the day of the conversion itself, it happens what, it, what the Talmud tells us and what the codes tell us, that they go through acceptance of mitzvahs, acceptance of commandments, and the uh, immersion. And after the immersion, they are 
Jewish as much as all of us are Jewish. We have a testing period of a year. We don't give them a certificate just to, to make sure that, you know, when a person, God forbid, um, slacks off or starts to renege on their responsibilities, then we put into question the initial sincerity. But once they uh, converted their Jewish, and if they, after one year, we consider they keeping up to the commitments, we present them with a certificate. This is how the process happens today, and it happens basically exactly the same way in, in every Beth Din you'll go to. You go to some longer, some shorter, with few of uh, more administrative differences or sort of outer differences, aesthetic differences, but ultimately the process is more or less the same, and, and there's no difference in the halachic part of it. The halachic part must be, must be always the same. But I want to ask a question which is very important to understand, and any, any thinking person can ask. Any, anybody that studies the primary sources can ask. If you open up the Code of Jewish Law, or the Maimonides, which is also now the Code of Jewish Law, you will see something interesting. You will see that the sages tell us as follows. They tell us that in the beginning when a, a potential convert comes to the Beth Din, the Beth Din investigates to see, to check the sincerity, Sincerity is very important. We are told that when Mashiach will come, there won't be any new converts. Those who have began the process and already shown the sincerity, they'll be able to complete. But um, nobody will be able to come and say, we want to convert now, because when it's popular, that's not what it's about. You have to, you have to embrace Judaism when it's, you know, when it's difficult. When, after Mashiach comes, the Jewish people will be very, very, so to speak, uh, highly regarded, and will be a very big yichus to become Jewish. And therefore... Now is the time. So, when the uh, Beth then checks the sincerity, it means that the person doesn't have any particular agenda why they want to become Jewish. And the Talmud, in, di in a different place, discusses certain times, in the times of King Solomon and so on and so forth, when a lot of people had agendas why they wanted to become Jewish. So they also said it could be. We'll talk about it soon. It could be either because they want to make aliyah or because they want to marry somebody, whatever the situation is. So they check the sincerity. And when they are convinced the person is sincere, they spend some time talking them out of it and telling them how difficult it is to be Jewish. And when they see the person is persistent and says, I want to be Jewish, then they teach them foundations of Judaism. They teach them like the 13 principles of faith the oneness of God, the concept of the Torah, the concept of uh, reward and punishment. They tell them about the idea that, that uh, the reward in the world to come. And after they teach them all of those things, if the person still wants to be able to convert, if it's a woman, they take her straight to the mikveh and they, she accepts the commandments and she immerses and becomes Jewish. And if it's a man, they circumcise him. They wait until he heals could take three, four weeks, and then they circumcise him. So we'll look at, at the Talmud, we'll look at the Rambam, Mamonides, we'll look at the Code of Jewish Law, and it seems that the process took for a woman one day, instead of a year and a half or two years, it was like a one-day process. And for men, maybe three weeks, just the waiting period between the circumcision. By the way, there, there is a, um, a discussion in, in a... In the, in the medieval sources, whether the order of circumcision and uh, immersion makes a difference. Because if it didn't make a difference, you could first make a person go to the mikveh and then circumcise them. But ultimately, we know that the final, final part of the process has to be immersion. That's why you must circumcise first and then wait for that amount of time. So, the question is, what changed? The law changed, we became stricter. Why is it that um, in those days, we're talking about 800 years ago, 500 years ago, it took one day, and today it could take two years, at least a year and a half? The answer is nothing has changed. The law is the same, but the circumcise sometimes dictate a change of policy, and I'll explain what I mean. 
before we even get to, to, to that sort of extreme between one day and a year and a half or two years, I can give you even a bigger extreme. If you open up a, uh, one of the codes written approximately 100 years ago, 100 and something years ago, it was written in the Russian Empire. In Russian Empire, as in Polish kingdom, it was forbidden by the law of the land to convert. Anybody who converted, both the person was punished and the Beth Din was punished. And therefore, there was no conversions whatsoever. There was one story about the famous Graf Potocki. He was the Count Potocki who lived in the, in the mid-18th century. And he became Jewish. He was the, the disciple of, of the Gaon of Vilna. He converted in Western Europe where conversions were allowed. When he came back to Eastern Europe, he was arrested. He was given ultimatum either to renounce uh, his Judaism or to be burnt at the stake. And when he refused to renounce his Judaism, he was publicly burnt. That was not in the 1400s in Spain. It was in 1700s in Poland. So no Beth Din actually conducted any conversions. And the Orach HaShulchan, Rabbi Epstein, who lived in the second part of the 1800s, of 19th century, he actually renamed, for security purposes, the chapter, he wrote a code of Jewish law based on the original code of Jewish law with some of the new, um, you know, new cases and so on and so forth. And he actually called the code of Jewish law, instead of calling it, uh, he called a particular chapter, instead of calling it Hilchus Geirim, laws of Geirim, he called it the laws of Geirim for those times when it was permitted to convert, because now it's forbidden under the law of the land. He made it into a huge uh, heading just to make sure that any censorship that reads the code wouldn't think that they are converting anybody. And as a matter of fact, every single time that he mentions a convert, he adds the words for those times when it was permitted to convert, just to make sure nobody will make a mistake. So you see that the reason why this, they didn't convert wasn't because the law changed, because the circumstances have changed. Now, what changed as far as the amount of time? It's very simple. In times of the Talmud, or in times of Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish Law, or the Rambam, all of the, the whole community was religious. There wasn't such a thing as an unobservant Jew. You couldn't find a Jewish person that would drive, that would break Shabbos or eat no kosher. On the other hand, the person who converted, he had to have a whole change of identity. They had to give up on, on the family because the families would disown them. They would have to give up on the community. They would have to give up on the prestige. And they would give everybody everything away to join the Jewish people. It was impossible for them not to keep Judaism because everybody kept Judaism. We live in a society when there's a lot of people who are born Jewish and out of, because of lack of education, they don't always keep things the way they should be kept. We don't judge them and we certainly don't in any way try to uh, belittle them or try to, you know, we try to educate and inspire. It's not a place to be able to dictate or judge and so on and so forth. But ultimately, in today's society, there is no much of a chance if a person just converts, they'll, they'll remain religious or they'll be religious. The only way to do it is if they really live that life and they know what it means um, for an extended amount of time. And only then they themselves, the, the Beth Din, the rabbi, the whole, the whole community will see that they're able to handle it. So that is basically the, the, the difference in uh, protocol, not because in any way um, it is... Um, the law has changed. The actual conversion is exa exactly the same, but it's because this, the circumstances changed and in order to ensure that they will remain observant, that is the only way to do it. The next question which I want to discuss, if you open up the Code of Jewish Law, you'll see that one of the things that the judges and the Beth Din had to look out for is any lack of um, sincerity and agenda. And one of the things that we are told, it says you have to look and see if it's a woman, Shema ain't, if, if it's a man, Shema ain't of Nosem but Isha Yehudis, if it's a man converting, maybe he found a Jewish girl 
and he knows that the only way he can marry her if he will convert. Vim Isha here, if it's a woman con- converting, boy came the check Acharet Shema in their Nosna Bachura Yisro. Maybe she met a Jewish guy and she wants to marry him. So it seems to be that one of the things that they didn't want to happen is a conversion for marriage. Now we know that a large percentage of people coming today to convert, the beginning of the journey begin, starts with a Jewish partner. A lot of people come on their own, but a quite a large percentage comes because they found a Jewish boy or a Jewish girl. And the question is, what happened? What does it mean that in the Code of Jewish Law it says that Beitkin Achrov, they check after him, they investigate if that's the case. And today we not only want, we, we expect them to be honest about it, and we involve the partner in the whole conversion process, and we don't um, disqualify the conversion because of that. I'm going to give you a couple of answers. One answer is, is described in Maimonides. In he, in, not in his code, but in his response. Maimonides has a particular question which was written, written to him in one of the neighboring countries. And they asked him about a particular Jewish man who was living with a non-Jewish woman. It was something unheard of in those days. And they said, what do we do with him? He's not about to break up with her. He's living with her. So the Rambam says, if they're willing to keep the commandments properly, and if she's willing to convert, convert her and marry them. And he says an interesting thing. He says it's because Takonos Ashovim, because in, in the, the Talmud and the codes don't disqualify the actual conversion. They just say that it's not the best way to, uh, to show your sincerity. But if the ultimate result will be that the person can, uh, is keeping the mitzvahs, the conversion is a valid conversion, even if it began in not such a kosher way. And he gives interesting wording over there to say that, that, that you choose what's better for Judaism ultimately, that it's not if the conversion wouldn't be kosher, then there's nothing to do about it. But nobody says the conversion is not kosher in such a case. All it says that it initially shows lack of sincerity. That's one answer. Another answer I would like to share with you is a very unusual story in a Talmud in a tractate called Menachus, page 45. They say a story there was a great rabbi called Rabbi Chia in Babylon. And um, Rabbi Chia had a yeshiva and uh, he had students. And it says that in this particular uh, city or maybe in a neighboring city, there was a prostitute who had a very, very, very uh, great reputation far and wide. And she was, used to charge a lot of money because she was sought after by everybody. And she charged a huge amount of money. And um, you had to pay up front and there was no money back. That's it. You have the money, it's finished. And a particular student of the yeshiva, his evil inclination, his uh, desire took over him. And he decided nobody will know. He'll go and he'll commit the sin with this particular prostitute. And uh, he went, he was hoping nobody will see him, and he probably got dressed a little bit different, nobody will recognize him, and he came in, and the Talmud goes into a very unusual description of what exactly happened, how he had to pay the money, the amount of money he had to pay, and exactly what happened when he walked into the room and she was there on, on his bed with a whole bunch of uh, mattresses and, 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 uh, and cushions and so on and so forth. And... Uh, And he was overcome by desire and he started to get undressed. And suddenly he came, he got entangled with something that religious Jews wear. It's called tzitzis. It's called the small talus which we wear, we have a big talus which we wear on our, when we pray. And the small tzitzis which we wear under the shirt. And when he saw the tzitzis, he experienced exactly what it says in the Torah, in the five books of Moses. It says that you will see that uh, the tzitzis, you remember the commandments and it'll stop you from committing sins. And that's exactly what happened to him. He suddenly realized, what am I doing? I'm a yeshiva boy, and I have such a illustrious teacher, and here I'm about to, just because of of a desire, of of a passing desire, I'm about to give everything up. And he told her, I'm sorry, I'm not going through with it. So she told him, you know, you're not going to get your money back. You already paid a huge amount of money. So he says to her, I know, but... uh, 
I'm a student in the yeshiva, I'm a religious Jew, and I just can't go through with it. I'm not, uh, you know, I remembered about the commandments, and I don't want to lose, you know, my consciousness and my, you know, respect of myself, so I'm not going through with it. So he left. The story didn't finish there. She was extremely impressed with him. She couldn't believe it's the first time it happened to her in her career that somebody already paid the money and didn't go through with it. So she tracked him down. She heard that he was a yeshiva boy. In that yeshiva, there was a famous yeshiva. So she actually went to the yeshiva and she went in and she said, you know, can I speak to this particular, can I find this boy? You can imagine how the guy felt. You know, he thought nobody will know. Suddenly, you know, it probably was very embarrassing for him. But uh, she went to the rabbi, Rabbi Chia, and she said, listen, there's a boy in your yeshiva that is a, has unbelievable ethics and standards, and I would like to convert and marry him. I would like to convert in order to marry him. And the rabbi listened to her, and he felt she was very sincere, and he converted her, and he conducted the wedding between her and this particular Jewish boy. And afterwards, the, the Gemara goes on to describe the wedding night, how everything that he wanted to do, exactly the same thing with all the cushions and everything else, but everything that he wanted to do in sin, now it happened already under the sanction of Jewish law. Now the question which a person can ask over here is, she actually told very clearly, I want to convert to marry this boy. So why couldn't the rabbi tell, listen, it says in the code of Jewish law that we check. If you want to convert to marry a Jewish boy, we disqualify. He didn't say that. And the answer as the later... Um, halachic decisors explain that it's not the question of the fact that somebody happens to have a Jewish uh, boyfriend or Jewish girlfriend that that disqualifies them it's a sincerity that when a person really wants to convert and eventually uh, every convert is supposed to be sincere about the conversion in many cases when the couple broke up and the converting party still went ahead and converted so it wasn't it was a clear indication that it wasn't just for marriage. There are a few other reasons, but I see that it, the time is uh, getting on, so I'm going to... Uh, but that answers more or less the question um, that when the Talmud and the codes tell us that you check whether or not they have a Jewish boyfriend or girlfriend or they're doing it for marriage, it's not because the having a Jewish partner in itself disqualifies you, is because in many cases it shows lack of sincerity. So if they could prove that they are sincere, we wouldn't disqualify them because initially it began as a result of uh, meeting a Jewish boy or girl. Because everybody has their own uh, fate, uh, how the connection with Yiddishkeit begins. Now, I'm going to talk about minors because that's really the, you know, we always have a, a question. It doesn't mean the whole lecture is about the question. We always present a question and I have to answer the question. The question is, I was converted as a child without consent. Nobody asked me. Usually you don't ask little kids if they want to convert, if they're three-year-old, two-year-old. And now I want to change my mind. Can I change my mind? So we here have to explain a little bit the concept of conversion. We know that with an adult, the most important component is the acceptance of mitzvahs, of commandments, the acceptance of Jewish life. And everything else is an imperative part of conversion, circumcision and immersion. But Kabbalah and mitzvahs, that's not just a part of conversion, that's conversion itself. And an adult has to accept the mitzvahs, and technically, it's irreversible. You can't change your mind. It's impossible to convert and say, you know what, I decided I don't want to be Jewish anymore. You can't. We tell the person it's irreversible and irrevocable. But a young child cannot accept commandments. A young child doesn't have the maturity or the, or the even an understanding to accept anything. So what's the logistics and what is the foundation of the conversion of a child if with a, an adult the most important part is acceptance of commandments and this is a subject of a, of a great discussion but basically the Talmud tells us that a young child you convert al das bezden the bezden has the power to merit the child in other words to say you know what uh, we can do something good for you it's it's a very um, expansive halachic concept which exists in many areas of Jewish law but basically the idea is you can't 
create a liability without a person's knowledge, but you can create a merit without a person's knowledge. And if the parents adopt a child, the parents want to adopt a child, and they say, listen, we want to bring him up in a loving home and in a home full of, of spirituality and, and, and uh, Judaism and everything else, that's considered to be a merit for the child. And therefore, the Talmud says you, uh, uh, it, it's not the mature acceptance of commandments, it's a, um, a merit that allows the bezin to extend to the child and to do everything else. You circumcise the child if it's a boy. You immerse the child in the mikveh as the last part of conversion, and that makes the child Jewish. Now, afterwards, the Talmud says that that particular um, schus, that particular merit, is has a statute of limitation. It's not forever. It's until you grow up, until you become a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. Because after that, the child can say, listen, I wasn't asked, and therefore I want to be able to do what I want. I want to eat what I want. I want to drive on Shabbos. I want to do whatever I want. And at that point, because he wasn't asked, we, t- we say that the schus, the merit, is until you're 13. At the age of 13 or 12, we give the child a chance to choose. It's done in a very delicate way. There's a protocol how to do it. We don't actually do it. In the, it's also unfair. to put In 99% of cases, a child that was adopted, he grew up in a, in a Jewish religious home, and we're not going to start playing with the mind. But we basically, the law says you have to be able, they have to know that they are converted. You can't lie to them, and you can't tell them they were born Jewish. And as long as they know that they are converted and they express their desire to continue to be Jewish, that's considered to be an acceptance, and they can never change their mind afterwards. So they, they have one chance to do it. Uh, and that, that is why it's important for them to know that they, have, they were converted. Because if they didn't know, they can always say, listen, the reason why I didn't object was because I didn't know. Had I known, I would have objected. So the, technically, they could object when they're much older. That's why it's important they should know throughout the, the, the young life that they were converted, that by the time they become adults, according to Jewish law, they could change their mind. I want to share with you a story that happened it was one of the first cases that I had over 20 years ago, probably 24 years ago. This story is very important to show how, number one, how important it is to understand the, the, the in order to rule in these areas, how to, how to understand it in its depth and from primary sources. And then at the same time, how important it is for any rabbi, any judge that deals with human lives to be able to uh, not rush with an answer. Always think about it, always look back, try to check the sources. The story goes back to about 1997, approximately. I was um, contacted by a, um, a friend of mine, a close friend, who is a very big rabbi in Northern America. He's a great Talmudic scholar, but there's a difference between his being a Talmudic scholar and he is a person that doesn't, uh, is afraid to be in a position to, to rule. Sometimes you could be a scholar, but you don't actually rule in questions of Jewish law. So he, it, you know, he's a very, you know, it doesn't take away from his scholarship, but that's what he chooses to do. Not everybody's in a position to become halachic decisors. So he would call me up with, with these sort of questions, and he told me a story that happened in his community. He says that he had a Jewish man who was married to a non-Jewish woman. They had two children. And at some point, they started to, to come back to Judaism. And she, uh, under the advice of the rabbi and his guidance, she went to the closest Beth Din, to a acceptable Beth Din, and uh, she began the process of conversion, which both the husband and the wife participated in. And uh, after a certain time, I don't know how long it took, maybe a year and a half, maybe two years, they converted to, uh, they beca- she became Jewish, and they converted the two young children. Now, they never told the children that they uh, were converted. The children grew up thinking they were born Jewish. They knew the mother converted, but they were never told, which is a mistake. And the family had other children also. And they brought up the kids in the religious schools and they went to, to the study. Then, like a regular religious child that grows up in an in, in observant home. And when the boy was about 17 years old, approximately, 
he had some kind of, of a uh, emotional emotional uh, crisis, maybe depression. He went through certain issues. And while he was going through everything, he was in sort of like an emotional turmoil, he suddenly finds out that he was adopted and that he was converted as a young child. So he goes to the rabbi that converted him, not to my friend, but to the, to the rabbi in the Beth Din that converted him. And he says, listen, I just found out that I wasn't born Jewish. And I heard that if you didn't know, you could still contest it. You can still uh, sort of uh, change your mind, even at this age, because I, until now, I didn't know. So the rabbi took out a volume of a very famous responsa of a scholar I mentioned in previous lecture called Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. It's a, it's a response. It's a, a response means an answer to a learned answer to a question. We discusses adopted children. And over there, he looked at it for about five minutes, and it said exactly what I told you now, that, that a child, uh, his conversion sort of goes on to, until he's an adult. And when he's an adult, if he knows about it, he can contest it. And if he didn't know about it, he can contest when he finds out. So he said to him, yeah, you can contest it. So the child said, okay, I'm not Jewish. He said, you're not Jewish. And the boy came home, and he told his parents, I'm not Jewish. It wasn't that he told him he wasn't religious, he told him he wasn't Jewish. You can imagine how it affected a Jewish home, how, what a trauma it was. And they felt intuitively and instinctively something was wrong. And they spoke to my friend, the rabbi, and he said, listen, how could that be done? At least you should have had some sensitivity to be able to, to, um, uh, to counsel him, to, you know, the boy obviously wasn't himself. And uh, my friend asked me, what do you think halachically uh, is the situation? I'll tell you in, in a nutshell, that why this was a mistaken ruling. Even though it's true that um, the Talmud says that a child can contest the conversion once he grows up, once he finds out, but if you look in a very, very uh, learned, res uh, learned um, response of a great rabbi called Hassam Seifer, who was a chief rabbi of Bratislava in the 1800s, who was considered to be one of the world's authorities. He analyzes the topic and he comes to the conclusion that there is a difference between a child who was adopted or came by himself at the age of nine or whatever it is, or a child that converted with one of the parents. And he, it's not the place for this lecture to explain the learned discussion, but he argues that somebody who was converted with one of the parents, it's a much, much greater level of schus, of merit, and therefore there is no possibility of, of uh, contesting it. And even though not everybody agrees with this rabbi, but number one, you wouldn't make a person non-Jewish against him. In other words, you could be strict and try to make sure that the uh, young man doesn't contest it, but you, should, you certainly could not take away the whole Judaism from a young man against the position of the rabbi. The end of the story was that at the time I wrote a, uh, a essay, a, um, a thesis about it, and I sent it to this particular uh, rabbi to give it to the head of the Beth Din, and when he saw it, he didn't argue about it. I brought many sources and many other opinions to show that this is an accepted opinion, and, you, and it's something that you, that you cannot ignore. But unfortunately, what happened was that the boy already tasted the uh, free life and he sort of didn't, he wasn't keen to come back. I ruled in my uh, response that the right thing to do is to take him through what's called the Gir Le Khumra, to a, another immersion and acceptance of mitzvahs out of doubt. In other words, since there is an argument, you, on one hand you can't make him not Jewish, on the other hand he should still, in order to avoid any question of his status, go through the final stages of conversion of accepting the mitzvahs and immersing in front of the Beth Din. And uh, the boy wasn't ready to do it. About three years later, I was uh, in, in the States and I was asked to give a, a lecture to a group of rabbis who were studying uh, to become like postgraduates. It was like a yeshiva for postgraduate rabbis. And I spoke about different... Um, uh, rules of uh, and, and uh, parameters of how to become a Pesach, how to become a somebody who, who makes decisions on Jewish law. And I spoke about the, the great responsibility. And I gave that 
particular story as an example. And as I'm doing now, I changed all facts. Nobody could tell from my story who it was. I changed, I didn't give names. I changed uh, locations and everything else. But after I finished telling the story and after I finished my lecture, one of the uh, rabbinic students, one of the rabbis, he said, can I talk to you for a few minutes? So I said, yes. And he said to me, I want to tell you something. I know exactly who you're talking about. This young boy was my roommate in the yeshiva. And I went with him throughout the whole story. And I want to give you the good news that just a few months ago, he had a change of heart and he decided to, to come back. And he did exactly what you, you were told. And, and he, um, uh, he accepted, he went through another uh, conversion out of doubt. It's called the Chumrah um, with the same Beth Din. And uh, now he's a religious young man. A few months later, the boy himself contacted me and he had certain questions to ask me, but that was the end of that particular story. I want to finish off with the last part of my um, lecture, and that involves the fact that we know that there's a lot of um, conditions in order for the conversion to be kosher. And one of them that it has to be an accepted Beth Din. And that's something which is a, uh, a subject of many, of many questions. People ask the question, who cares what the Beth Din is? Doesn't matter that I want to convert, and who cares if it's uh, this Beth Din or that Beth Din, whether it's Reform, Conservative, or some Orthodox Beth Dins are not accepted. Who decides what is accepted, what is not accepted? And I don't know if I'll have time to finish it, but I'm going to tell you in a nutshell. We know that the... Uh, the word orthodox is a, is a fairly new word. It only came into the Jewish world to distinguish between real authentic Judaism that follows the, the tenets and the, and the requirements of Jewish law. And it's not free for all that each rabbi can decide what he does. We have to be faithful to, to, to halacha. And every other movement that discarded that principle, which was reform and conservative, we can call it halachic Judaism. Orthodox is just another way to distinguish between this, more of a formal sort of political terminology. But the real word is halachic, authentic Judaism. And that Judaism doesn't become changed or diluted because of, of uh, people's opinions, how they decide what suits the particular times, whether su su suddenly we should change the criteria of a Jew. And especially when it comes to this particular subject, it boils down to the integrity of the Jewish people, who is a Jew. So in 1948, when the state of Israel was established, Ben-Gurion understood it. He wasn't a religious man, and he didn't want to create a religious state. He created a state where both religious people and not observant people live together. At the same time, he also understood that certain parts of Judaism that really, if you will not take the halachic position, it will divide us and create a, ga a, a gap which will not be able to be breached. And those are the things that define us as... Uh, our status. So, for example, he said, number one, that uh, marriages have to be religious marriages. And till today in Israel, if you want to get married, if you're a Jewish person, you're only married under Orthodox um, uh, standards, after halachic standards. A get a, a divorce also. Can you imagine if you would say you can get divorced any way you want? With all the problems I spoke about last week's, about Mamzeris and all these things, there would be, it, it, it would create a situation where it would almost like cut off certain parts of Jewish people from each other. And then he said also that the definition of a Jew, which also includes conversion, also has to follow halacha. And he defined it in the law of Knesset. He said that a Jew is decided according to halacha. It's either somebody born from Jewish mother or converted according to halacha. And this was a status quo until 1970, from 1948 to 1970. In 1970, somebody in the Knesset lobbied, I don't know who it was, it didn't do us any favors. It's a purpose, because of the pressure from the wealthy people of the reform movement in America, they started to pressure the Israeli uh, government to change the law in the Knesset, the constitutional law, and to change the criteria of a Jewish person. They haven't changed the mother part, they said, born from Jewish mother, but they took away the halacha part. They said, anybody who wants to have the... Um, and, and if you ask a question, how can the Knesset altogether decide who's a Jew? It's not for them to decide. Uh, it wasn't in the context of religion which they decided. It was in the context of 
uh, of return to Judaism. In other words, uh, sorry, return to Israel, Chok uh, Ashvut, the ability to immigrate to Israel, and also ability to marry. That also includes it, ability to marry within the Jewish people. So, in 1970, the law, the, not the law, God forbid, but the law in the Knesset was changed, which created a tremendous, tremendous amount of problems for the Jewish people, which I won't go into. But when somebody asked the question, how could somebody have a monopoly on conversion? Who decides what's kosher? I'll give an example. Let's say somebody walks into my office and says, look, I want to uh, basically be called up to a Torah. Or I want to be able to have a bar mitzvah. I want to be able to marry a Jewish girl. Whatever they, they want to ask. Something that requires you to be Jewish. And I look at him and the person, his name is uh, um, Mr. Christopher uh, Smith. And he doesn't look Jewish at all. And I ask him, you know, are you Jewish? He says, of course I'm Jewish. He says, he says your, your parents are Jewish? No, my parents are not Jewish. He says, I, you know, he tells me, um, I say, you want to convert? He says, why should I convert? I'm Jewish. So basically what he's telling you is that who are you telling me who, who, uh, if I'm Jewish? I decide, who, who, I'm, I decide, not you. Every person can decide what he is. So everybody would understand that it doesn't really make sense. You can't just come along and decide that you're Jewish. But the question is, why not? If, unless you accept halacha, unless you accept Jewish law as being the decisive factor of who is a Jew, nothing else makes sense. You can, it's free for all. And then it doesn't make any, any difference. The, the question becomes different. Why do you, do you need a reform conversion altogether? Why need any ceremony? If it's free for all, then anybody can decide what they are. Once we agree that we can't decide on who is a Jew, because it's not up to us, it's not up to rabbis, it's not up to any individual rabbi, it's up to the old age Torah and halacha, then you have to also come to the conclusion that the same way as the definition of a born Jew is defined by halacha, similar definition of how you convert to Judaism is defined by halacha. And it's not something which anybody can decide whether they decide that it goes after the father or it goes unto uh, anybody's whim or under any particular conversion that is not halachic and reform and conservative, they don't follow halacha. Then the question becomes deeper. Sometimes we also come to a situation where certain botadin, I wanted to talk more about it, but I, I will stop here and I will give time for questions. Because sometimes we also find a situation where there's some bethdins that are in a list of accepted, recognized bethdins, and some are not. And something which really requires a much, much greater discussion. I wish I could really talk more about it. <coughs> but the answer is that just like in the world we live in, there is more and more understanding and recognition that we need standards in every single area of life. In medicine, for example. In medicine, different medical groups establish certain standards in order to be able to protect the consumer. And if a particular doctor starts to break the standards in order to do somebody a favor or something like that, he will be evicted from that establishment. Standards are created in every area of life to protect the consumer. And if this is the case with every area of physical life, it's also the, the, the same applies to Jewish law. It's not free for all. And therefore, in every area of expertise, there are establishments that are created to protect the uh, re recipients of that service. And if there is a particular Beth Din that, that just ad hoc, they, they decided to come together and do it on their own, they, you have to earn your reputation in order to be able to be accepted. And this is something spoken about, not just in 21st century. The Rambam talks about it in 850 years ago. He talks about the conversions done by ad hoc Beth Dins. And he says they're not to be accepted. There's this whole process I have to see where they are. And then, you know, today if somebody is, is converted by a Beth Din which is not accepted, they would have to go through, a, again, a conversion, sometimes out of doubt, maybe, you know, we're not judging over here. Maybe they were sincere, the people converted. But ultimately, um, we can only judge by the experts who conduct the conversion, and only they, they can assure that everything was done uh, according to Jewish law without any... any uh, failure to give over that particular um, I wouldn't even call it a service that particular um, uh, assistance 
to a person who's converting because the rabbis are not converting, Hashem is converting him, and the rabbis are the, the, uh, the vessels that once they do everything according to halacha with all the expertise in the halacha, then they become Hashem's tools to create a, a, a new soul, a person with a new soul. So, in um, Mirza Hashem, next week we're going to talk about how fertility treatments affect um, Jewish status. But uh, in the meantime, I would like to see if there's any questions. Yes? Sorry, uh, we have over here, huh? uh, Reb Aaron Sirot, like last time, everybody knows already, he is uh, here to be the moderator, and he will, anybody who puts the questions on, on the chat, he will give over the question to me, and I'll try to uh, answer. So our first question is as follows. There are so many lenient conversions claiming there are orthodox. What is the position towards converts who were converted in bet in bettings that are not approved by Israeli rabbanut? Uh, it, it's really the the question was probably written before I spoke for the last five minutes. It's it's what I spoke about just at the end. It's not just about rabbanut. It goes beyond that. There is a, there are certain um, standards which are all around the world in America, in England, in South Africa, in Australia, and the beth dins that are uh, accepted into the uh, list uh, and they are recognized both by the expertise and by the standards they are accepted and anything else not accepted because anything else doesn't assure us that everything was not according to Jewish law next question so with regards to the test period of um, after the conversion, there's one year, someone is asking why only one year? If after a few years, a convert fries out, meaning he drops everything, can't the base then retroactively consider their gear as worthless? All right. The answer is that, you know, we hope and pray that it's not going to happen. And I must say that in the vast, vast majority of cases, it doesn't happen especially in the last, I would say, uh, uh, seven, eight years. We were actually putting together a list of all the past converts, and, and it's something that, that they, uh, thank God, we see that years, years beyond, after the conversion, the, the family was still in contact with many, many families. They're still keeping everything. But ultimately, the, uh, the poskim tell us, the decision of, of, of halachic decisors is, that the reason why we create a particular time period is not because we're coming to claim that a convert is not Jewish anymore. It's because we are not prophets and we cannot really know the sincerity of a person. So if somebody, for example, converted and a few weeks later they are not uh, the breaking laws, it puts into question the sincerity. So it's possible in theory that uh, from the point of view of, uh, you know, the heavens, so to speak, you know, the higher plane, that a, uh, a convert was extremely sincere and they converted and something happened to them that is some kind of a, I don't know, crisis or whatever it is, and uh, they uh, suddenly became heretics and they stopped believing in everything. Um, according to Jewish law, really the Jewish, but no Bethany will accept them because the... The Talmud says it's lefi reois eine hadain. Ultimately, Hashem leaves it the sincerity up to the um, the uh, physical eyes of the judge. Now we are prepared to be very naive and uh, trust people when they when they uh, uh, tell us certain things, you know, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, if uh, it's obvious that um, the chances are that there was no sincerity then the Bethden is not supposed to accept it. And that was the position of Ramon Feinstein. He gave different criteria to some students. He said six months, and some he said one year. But in almost every Bethden, we give a year, you know, for two reasons. First of all, usually after one year, they continue to be from. It gives them that level of, you know, to, to get used to it and everything else. And second of all, even though they have reneged on, the, on the, the, so to speak, betray the trust placed in them, and it's something which is not very, it, it's very disappointing if even after a year or two years or three years, they 
stop or go down in levels of observance. But at the same time, it's from a Jewish law perspective, you can't say they're not Jewish anymore. Okay, next question. Even after the conversion, there's often the feeling or experience of fellow Jews saying that a convert is not a real Jew. How could a convert deal with it? We know clearly that he's a righteous, they are a righteous convert and is uh, completely a part of the Jewish nation, but how can a convert deal with these Right, right. So first of all, there are 613 mitzvahs in the Torah, and one of them is to love a convert. So just like there's the people who, unfortunately, don't eat kosher or break Shabbos, they can also break, you know, people break certain laws, and one of the laws they break sometimes is that particular law, because you're supposed to love the convert, a true convert, and you're supposed to treat him as a Jew. It's true that, that all of us have different um, laws that apply to us. For example, a Kohen has certain kinds of laws, a Levi in other kind of laws, an Israel another kind of laws, and a Ger and a convert, and certain things that apply to him that, that don't apply to anybody else. But as far as being considered to be a Jew, he's as much as a Jew as anybody else as long as he's, he did it according to halacha, according to Jewish law. And therefore, if, if somebody comes along and looks at a righteous convert and says that he's less of a Jew, it's number one, it's usually out of ignorance. And number two, it's also, unfortunately, this person is actually committing, is violating a, uh, a negative commandment, a biblical commandment. All right. Someone is asking, any advice for converts whose parents are or were against the conversions? Right. Look, it, it, it happens sometimes. And, um, uh, you know, in, in our experience, some people are converting, they have a tremendous, tremendous support from the families, non-Jewish families, and some people don't have that. And um, ultimately, you know, while we don't push anybody to convert, but somebody that is uh, very um, persistent in their commitment, and they do it despite all obstacles and all challenges, um, we tell them that they has to be always try to uh, guide them uh, into a very delicate balance. On one hand, not to compromise Jewish law, which you can't. On the other hand, always to be respectful to your family, especially to your parents who gave life to you. So we, um, just like with anybody else that may experience ridicule from his family, somebody who becomes religious at the age of 20, 30, 40, whatever it is, and sometimes people make fun of him. Uh, we are told that a sincere person doesn't change his position because of peer pressure. So a sincere convert will, despite opposition and despite uh, sometimes um, s um, lack of cooperation and lack of support, he, they will still do what they want to do. They're adult people. But at the same time, they always have to remember not to become disrespectful and always to be able to uh, remain close to the parents if they can without at the same time violating Jewish law and the principles. All right, next question. Do converts have to correct cosmetic-related changes they have made before converting, i.e. tattoos, cosmetic surgery, implants, etc.? No, they don't have to. There is a, a very, very old um, myth that many people who went through Jewish schools come, come out with, and I hear this all the time, that somebody who has a tattoo can be buried in a Jewish cemetery. So there, it's, it's true that we're not allowed, according to Jewish law, to put a tattoo. But once it's there, there's no obligation to remove it, right? And uh, sometimes, you know, if it's like a person who's completely covered with it, it's, you know, it's not very, <laughs> uh, anyway, at least not to my taste, but, uh, but, but uh, nevertheless, it doesn't, uh, uh, there's no obligation to remove it. Okay, next question. Uh, age 12 and 13 are basically children today. Why not wait until they are much older and until they make that official informed decision? With many religious kids choosing to leave the path of Judaism, isn't it better they are not halakhically Jewish if they end up not being religious than being halakhically Jewish and end up sinning? The same acts would be non-sins if they weren't halakhically Jewish. Okay, the all very good questions. And the answer the question is a good question, but, but the, um, the bottom line is we didn't make the law. Hashem made the law. So Hashem in his wisdom saw that ultimately it, it's better for, the, for, the, uh, for them to make a decision when they are adults 
for that purpose, when they're considered to be uh, not minors anymore, I wouldn't call them adults in the ultimate sense. They don't move out of the house and they still have to listen to their parents. But uh, in, in Jewish religious life, they're not considered minors anymore. They're allowed to part of the minion. They're allowed to do all the things that an adult can do. And in such a case, Hashem has decided in His wisdom, knowing the psychology and knowing the, the psyche of, of human beings, that nevertheless it's better for them not to be traumatized by that. And, and there is a, even from a psychological point of view, there is a very big merit to it. Uh, if there would be time, I would explain it, but I think that it would suffice to say that it's not a rabbinic law, but it's actually a biblical decision that, uh, uh, that that's the case. All right, we're left with two more questions. All right. Was Jewish lineage claim always by the mother, or is it only after the Jews left Egypt? Right. Uh, it's actually was fixed in the foundation of, of our Torah, after they left Egypt, 40, not 50 days later, uh, at Mount Sinai, when they received the Torah, Hashem told, gave them the Torah and included the position and the foundation, who is a Jew. Okay, final question. Um, it's a follow-up question about a Koyen marrying a Ger. And why are the Syrian... Com- oh, that's a good question. Syrian community. Why are the Syrian community in America excluding converts from marriage? Okay. I was actually going to, if I would have more time, I had in mind to talk about it in, in, the, in, the, in this lecture, but somebody asked the question, so I will, um, I will what was the question about, about a coin first? No, it's regarding a coin. It's two separate questions. Um, no, I guess it's just, why are the Syrian community in America excluding okay. converts from marriage? So there are two separate things. A coin cannot marry a convert um, biblically, so it's not it's not something that uh, again it it it's nothing to do. With a coin can't marry somebody who was divorced, but he can marry somebody who is a widow. So it's it's basically a what's called a xerus akosov. It's not a law which was which has any logic. It's 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 divine logic. Um, it's not in any way uh, to say that converts are second class citizens any more than to say that a lady who. Um, was raped or a lady that uh, divorced is a second class citizen. Judaism, it's nothing, um, uh, there's no truth whatsoever, but that's the case. As far as the Syrian community is concerned, many years ago, uh, the Syrian community made certain internal decisions. Now, according to Jewish law, a community is allowed, obviously it's not just any member, but the, the rabbis, the leaders of the community, are allowed to make certain legislations that affect only them. I will discuss uh, in a, another lecture, when I talk about the structure of Judaism, a few questions I promised to, to answer. Um, I uh, will discuss which legislations are binding to all Jews and when it stopped, and which legislations can be made in, in individual community uh, by, by rabbis of a, whoever, a authority for a particular flock under their responsibility. The Syrian community, which is a, a very large community in certain areas outside, today hardly anybody lives in Syria anymore, they all moved out, but some of the centers of Syrian communities, number one in New York, in Flatbush, anybody goes to Ocean Parkway, there's a huge uh, Syrian shul, there's uh, thousands and thousands of Syrian Jews. In Argentina, and a few other places, in Panama, Panama is a very strong community, I've been there, and um, I've been there t- uh, for, fertil- in other words, to set up fertility um, clinics under my supervision, and I had a chance to see the community. It's a community of 8,000 people, and you feel like it's 100,000 people. It's such a strong, vibrant community. And the bulk of the community are Syrian Jews. Now, it's true that at this many years ago, I think probably over 100 years ago, they've created certain legislations which include certain rules like a decrease for the, for the Kehillah, that they don't accept converts. Why did they do it? It was um, a number of reasons. I'm not going to g- claim to give you all the reasons, but I'll give you just one particular scenario, that they felt that while in some communities conversion saves us from assimilation and saves us from intermarriage, over there it had the opposite effect. It broke up families. What used to happen is that many of the members used to wealthy uh, businessmen, they used to dra- trade in diamonds or other um, commodities, and they would travel in business. 
they would come back with a young girl, non-Jewish girl, they would divorce the wife and they would marry them. And, and they felt that ultimately it's causing a, um, a breakup of families rather than strengthening families. There are other reasons too, but they've decided that they don't accept converts. In Panama, with which I have a lot to do, they have slightly modified. In, in Argentina, for example, they have a rule you can't convert in Argentina. I have a, uh, a very close colleague and a, uh, a relative, actually, who is a very prominent rabbi in Argentina. And whenever he conducted conversions, he did them in Uruguay, which was right next door, but he couldn't do it in Argentina itself. In Argentina, there's no uh, uh, conversions. As far as the community itself is concerned, in Panama, they have the following rule. If somebody converts on their own somewhere else, in a different, for example, in America, and they come to Panama, they, first of all, they make sure they convert it with a recognized Beth Din that is on a list of accepted Beth Dins. And then they give them like a two year, you know, we give them one year. But on top of that one year, when they move to the community, they give them a two year probation. And when they feel that they are um, um, satisfied with the sincerity and with the commitment, then they will accept that convert and they will start treating them like everybody else and with the same respect. Again, uh, it's not something that affects the whole Jewish world. For them specifically, it saved them. And in Panama, there's no assimilation whatsoever. And uh, the Syrian Jews are very, very powerful in their, um, in the Jewish sense. In other words, they're, they're very, very vibrant, strong uh, communities as a result of it. And again, I'm not saying for somebody else, it would be wrong to do that. And for, for most, in for Australia or for America, it would actually cause a lot of bad things for Jewish people if it would stop conversion. But for Syrian Jews, it worked. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Again, next week, the lecture will be dedicated to a very, very uh, sort of cutting edge topic, dealing with some of the modern fertility um, advancements, such as surrogacies, egg donations, and so on and so forth. And how, do this, how does it affect the laws of Jewish status or the laws of conversion and so on and so forth? Otherwise, I bless you all with a very, very good week, and God bless you all. All the very best.